They let all those old people in early. I'm sorry? They let all those old people in early. They didn't have a choice. <laughs> well, yeah, they could have let us been run down. <laughs>
Greetings, everyone. Everyone, please take your seats and be ready to welcome the new...
Good afternoon, everybody. Before we begin, I'd just like everybody to please uh, silence your cell phones. For shows to the rabbis, Rabbi Feldman, Rabbi Feldman, Chief Rabbi Lau, the esteemed community rabbis who are here, and everyone gathered today, on behalf of the Board of Trustees of Beth Jacob, it's my distinct honor to welcome you to the momentous moment in the history of our show and to rededicate the crown of this shul, the main sanctuary. I want to extend a special welcome to the rabbis, the dignitaries, and others who have joined us to celebrate this milestone in our history. A special welcome to Ambassador Judith Barnai Shore, the Consul General of the State of Israel for the Southeastern United States. We're honored to have you here and joining us. Thank you. This project, phase one of our sanctuary rededication, has been long in coming. It represents a momentous time in the story of our show as we celebrate the towering spiritual accomplishments of the people who have emanated from this space in times past and look forward to many more years of beloved dedication to Hashem and His Torah through the walls of the sanctuary. 
It's incredibly humbling for me to stand here tonight as one small part of a chain of generations of incredible Jewish leaders who built this institution with their resources, with their energy, with their devotion, with their toil, dedicating themselves to bring the light of total true Judaism to Atlanta, Georgia for the last 25 years. As all of you know, this project has been a partnership of many members of our community. Dozens of individuals have stepped up over the last years, both financially, with skills, with their energy, to make this possible. It's obviously impossible tonight, but without each and every one of you, none of this would be possible. Among the countless individuals who have devoted hours of time and energy to this project, I'd like to extend a special recognition to the steering committee of phase one of our project, which is chaired by Michael Sanker. Zahava Corlin, and of course, our own Rabbi Elon Feldman, who dedicated countless, countless hours to achieving this dream. I also want to extend a special thank you to Miriam Khan, who stepped up to chair the Capital Campaign Committee and publicity for the renovation project at a time when a few others wanted to step forward and take ownership of it, and she really put her all into the project. In addition, I want to thank Larry Grayson, who served as the project manager at a critical juncture in coordinating this, uh, the, the design and fundraising efforts of our sanctuary. And of course, I'd like to thank Sandy Cooper, our architect from, Sandra, uh, from Cooper, Collins, and Carusi, and his architectural team, as well as Mitchell George and John Tomlinson of Humphreys and Companies, our general contractor. This dedication weekend was the brainchild of our own executive director, Rabbi Yitzhak Tendler, who along with our incredibly committed office staff never fails to drive himself to the ends of the world to think big for our show and execute his dreams and passion with incredible reassuring calm. Thank you, Rabbi Tendler. <laughs> and last but not, but certainly not least, we recognize our maintenance staff led by Mr. Ryan Langlinet, who put themselves out with good cheer, flexibility, devotion over the past year, the myriads and myriads of tasks that went into keeping the show together throughout this very transitionary period for the last year as we are dedicating this show. Please note, as you look around you, that this project is still a work in progress and it is incomplete. There are many details that are not in place, in place like the shulfan cover, the final pulpit furnishings, the art curtains, among many others. We acknowledge that the mechitza has not been fully tweaked yet to maximize the sight lines and, uh, between certain parts of the room and the pulpit. And like any renovation project, we ask for your patience, for your forbearance and tolerance as we settle into our newly renovated home. Please feel free to email the office with any thoughts and comments starting tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> As you all know, in 1952, a young man, fresh out of yeshiva and soon to be married, stepped onto the train platform in Atlanta's old Union Station, launching a fateful journey into the unknown. Now, almost 65 years later, who could have thought that so much spiritually could have been accomplished in this sleepy southern town? Tonight, we dedicate our sanctuary in honor of Rabbi Emanuel and Estelle Feldman, in whose merit every ounce of prayer, study, kindness, and devotion to Hashem and God. Instead, he brought the eternal, God-centered Torah values that have driven this shul since the day it was formed, continue to drive it today, and will continue to drive this shul into the future.
Perhaps the defining moment that most of you know in this school's history was celebrated in Rabbi Feldman's book, Tales Out of Shul, The Case of the Missing Mechitza, a pivotal moment to find the values that we still cherish in the shul today. Rabbi Feldman, still a young rabbi, decided it was time to install Mechitza in his fledgling shul at a time when Mechitzas across the country are being torn down to make way for progressive, more progressive, more inclusive Judaism, supposedly. Rabbi Feldman had the Mechitza built and installed, and it debuted on the first night of Slichos. When the board, not our board, <laughs> saw what Rabbi Feldman had perpetrated, they stormed out. We've never done that. <laughs> the next morning, the Mechitza had disappeared. But Rabbi Feldman, with the Rebbitzin's unwavering support, stood his ground and informed the board that if the Mechitza was not replaced by Rosh Hashanah, he was gone. After a week of the board cajoling and trying to convince him and begging him to reconsider, Rabbi Feldman refused to back down when the sanctity of God and the sanctity of Ashul and the sanctity of Hashem's Torah in this world was at stake. He had only one care. Kiddu Shem Shemayim, sanctifying the name of God in the world. Then, as you all know, on the morning of Rosh Hashanah, the Machitza magically reappeared, forever redefining the trajectory of the Atlanta Jewish community. Thank God we don't have these problems today in our shul. But, to me, this is an inspiring moment. This is a seminal moment that set in motion the values of this shul for all eternity. And that is that this shul is about one singular vision, sanctifying God's name in the world no matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter where you come from, nothing else. We're not driven by political persuasions, we're not driven by social trends, we're not driven by money, we're not driven by anything else. Only one question defines every decision that we make in this shul. Does it bring us closer to sanctifying Hashem's name in the world, and does it bring us closer to actualizing Hashem, Hashem's purpose for the Jewish people in the world? And that is a message that spans generations, and that is a message, a message that never dies. And that, my friends, is a secret of Beth Jacob's success in Atlanta. And that is a secret that Rabbi Feldman, Rabbi Emanuel Feldman, brought to Atlanta. That is a secret that Rabbi Elon Feldman, our current Rav, continues to bring to us day in and day out in Atlanta. And that is a secret that will always emanate from this building and from this space into the future until Mashiach comes. Therefore, Rabbi Feldman, Rabbi Emanuel Feldman, is our deepest and most profound honor to dedicate this sanctuary, the place that will forever perpetuate the spiritual values that you brought into this town to you and your Rebbitzin. We are so fortunate that you are here with us today to celebrate this day. And with that, I would like to call on Rabbi Emanuel Feldman to preside over the lighting of our iconic Ner Tummy, the eternal flame, the same flame that has been burning in this shul, in this sanctuary for over 65 years. Thank you.
Thank you, Mark. dedicating the shul in our honor. Uh, my wife and I appreciate the thought very, very much. It's an extremely kind gesture on the shul's part. But you and I know to whom the shul is really dedicated. And it's not any human being. It's dedicated to the one above who in the history of this shul, from its small, humble beginnings downtown on Boulevard, has provided us with guidance and now and then with hidden miracles so that we could come to this day, Shechionu Vikimonu Vigionu Lazman to this moment. So it's to him that we dedicate this beautiful sanctuary. This is a moment of memories. I don't think I'll be able to get through them all without choking up, but I'll try. I look around here, and I think about the millions of words of prayer that have emanated from this room over the years. Words of joy and words of grief, laughter, weeping, celebrations of baby naming and bris milah and bar mitzvahs and bas mitzvahs and weddings and prayers for the sick, and funerals. All together, we've been part of this over the years. We've grown up together. I don't know about you, but I certainly did grow up together because when I came, I was just 24 years old. My beard was not yet black, much less white. Because <laughs> I had none. We've grown up together, we've learned together, learned Torah together, lived life as a community together. We've had ups and downs and peaks and valleys, which is part of life. 
We've celebrated and experienced the heights of joy and also the depth of despair. All in these walls, all in this place, look around, I think of what this place has experienced over the years. The solemnity of Yom Kippur, the awesome sounds of the shofar on Rosh Hashanah, the ethereal, beautiful quality of, of Sukkot, the kindling of the Hanukkah menorah, the controlled madness of Purim, the joys of Pesach, the all-night Torah learning of Shavuos. We've done all this together as a community. And today we come together once again to dedicate our old shul, but ever new shul, with rededication of our energies and so forth. And it's appropriate that we should also have a combination of simcha, a dedication of a new Sefer Torah by the Schloss and Resnick families. It's appropriate because yesterday in Pirkei Ovos, we read chapter six, which is Perikinian Torah, which tells us how to acquire the Torah. And we today have acquired a new Torah, maybe be worthy to really live up to it. Yesterday, Bilam, the heathen prophet, tried to curse the Jewish people. Well, it really wasn't yesterday, it was a few thousand years ago. <laughs> but it was yesterday, because the Torah is eternal. Nothing changes. We still have people out there who curse the Jewish people, and worse. And the Gemara of Talmud and Sanhedrin tells us that Bilam, most of all, wanted us not to have bote midrashos or bote knossos He didn't want us to have study halls to learn Torah, and he didn't want us to have synagogues to pray to God. This was the object of his curse, not to have study Torah and not to have anyone praying to God. That would guarantee he knew the destruction of the Jewish people, the end of Am Yisrael. He knew that a synagogue represents an Edo, the Hebrew word for a community, a tzibur, a public, an Edo. But Edo also means aid, ayin dalit, which means a witness. Edo, ayin dalit, means a community. Sibur, but Ayin Dalit also means witness, testimony. And the Shul represents a testimony and witness to the existence of a Creator. Why was Bilam against this? Why did he want to destroy this? Because he knew that these were the bulwarks and the refuge from the inroads of the outside world. Therefore, his curse was turned into a blessing by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The words that we say every morning in the davening, Matovu Ohalecha Yaakov. How goodly are thy tents, O Yaakov, O people of Israel, O house of Jacob, of Beth Jacob. Mishkin Osecha Yisrael, your dwelling places, O people of Israel. Today, we pay tribute to the sacrificial giving of living members who made all this possible. 
as well as to those no longer in life who also made all this possible. And some of those no longer in life were not fully observant Jews, but they saw in Orthodox Judaism, in classical Judaism, they saw in Torah and in Jewish tradition, they saw the bulwark and the refuge and the future of Am Yisrael. And they supported it with their lives, with their fortune. I pay tribute to them. They're not here today. There are very few people who were here in 1952 uh, when my wife and I first came. There are one or two that I recall, but I won't mention their names. I only get in trouble whenever I mention names. I have enough trouble already. <laughs> it is a tremendous honor to have Rabbi Yisrael Mayor Lau is our special guest this whole Shabbos. The former beloved chief rabbi of Israel. Former only in title, but not in the present tense. He's still beloved. He's the former beloved chief rabbi. He's a former chief rabbi, but he's still the present day beloved Chief Rabbi of the Jewish people, not only in Israel, but wherever he goes. He's a tremendous ambassador to all kinds of Jews, not just Orthodox Jews, not just Haredi Jews, not just modern Orthodox Jews, but the non-observant Jews, the non-Orthodox Jews, to secular Jews, to non-Jews, to Muslims. He has a special gift of reaching out to everybody. Rarely in the annals of the chief rabbinate in Israel has there been one man who's been so beloved. Rabbi Lau will be introduced later. I don't mean this as an introduction to him, but he will be t talking later. But I want to introduce the members of Beth Jacob to you, Rabbi Lau. I want you to know who you're talking to. Rav Lau, in 1952, Orthodox Judaism was down for the count. I don't know whether there's an expression down for the count in Hebrew, but it means we were one foot in the grave. It took a certain madness, a certain craziness to imagine that from the ashes of Torah in America in 52, this little shul would become a beacon of light for Torah and for its values and its mitzvahs in this community and in many communities around the country. So this is again a tribute to the men and women of those years who had the faith and the courage and the sheer ornery stubbornness to follow the impossible dream as some of you are here today. Again, I won't mention names. You know who you are. Who had faith and took a chance in engaging a 24-year-old rabbi and his 20-year-old, his 20-year-old bride. I still remember the day I came off the train in Union Station. Is there still a Union Station downtown? Not anymore. Came off the train and was met by a couple of the officers of the show in August of 1952. They kept looking for a rabbi. They kept overlooking me. <laughs> Where's the rabbi? He didn't get off the train. <laughs> and finally, when I met them and told them who I was, they said, oh, we thought you were a shortstop, <laughs> a left fielder, a rabbi. But they took a chance with me. 
They didn't always agree with where I was going. Some of them wanted to follow others who had an easier way for popularity. But they stayed the course. They stayed the course. And I echo thinking of them and thinking of you, you, yourselves, and your forebears. I think of the Pusik in Yermia when Prophet Jeremiah says, Zacharti loch chesed neurayach. You know the Pusik because we sing it on the high holidays. Zacharti loch chesed neurayach. Ahavas klulosoyach. Singing is, is a part of the admission price. And, you know, <laughs> but you remember that because our choir from Chazan always sings it. Jeremiah says, says, I remember, I remember the Jewish people, and I repeat that. You followed me into the desert, says God. And I say, Humbly, you followed me as well into the desert because you didn't know where I was taking you. Into an Eretz Lozarua, a land that was not sown. Where is this rabbi taking us? But you followed me, you stayed with it. And those people are here today. Their antecedents, their forebears are here today in spirit. And I pay tribute to them, and I will never forget them. So this shul is dedicated to them and to you, their inheritors, but mostly to our Creator above. I don't want to take too much more time. I do want to say one thing. Today we also dedicate the world's most creative and original mechitza. A mechitza where the women can see everything and the men can see nothing, which is a paradigm of real life. <laughs> There's only one other being in the universe who sees everything but cannot be seen. Uponai lo yero, said God to Moshe, a face shall not be seen. What does this say about our women? Does this mean that our women are godly? You can answer that yourselves. The women are nodding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's also, I want to mention before I uh, step back, today's a happy birthday to guess who? Guess who? You're right. Our son. I would sing, but uh, one song per sermon is enough. <laughs> the kindling of the Ner Tomid. Well, the eternity of the Torah. The eternity of the Jewish people and the eternity of the Jewish soul. We have, we Jewish people have a different eternal light. Our eternal light is not the light of the flat TV screen. It's not the light of the smartphone. There's nothing wrong with those. But our eternal light is something else entirely. And it is that light, that eternity, that we dedicate today. May that light never be extinguished as we continue to grow in our community, 
May we continue to strive for greatness and love and understanding and tolerance for one another. May we continue to reach upward. We have a high ceiling. Reach upward towards it. And truly, matobu oholecho yako. How goodly are thy tents, O Jacob. And now I would ask you as a community to please answer Amen. A heartfelt Amen to the bracha that I'm about to recite. The bracha that says, say Amen to the Hebrew, but the bracha in translation is, Blessed art thou, the Lord King of the universe, who is good and does good. And at this moment, when we celebrate this triumphant revisiting of our shul, I'll say the bracha and I'll ask you to answer Amen. Baruch Ato Adonai Eloheinu Melech Oilom Hatov Fehametiv. following are on page 11, and please remain standing.
trying to get used to the view. Earlier this morning, I had the privilege of FaceTiming with my mother in Israel. And the first words out of her mouth were, you have a huge ego to throw such a birthday party on your birthday. <laughs> this is uh, obviously larger than any human being, larger than anyone's birthday. I'm sure it's not lost on many of you that the sun is reaching the top of the trees on the western half of the sky. And many of us have gathered here year after year at such a point at the Elah, at the closing of Yom Kippur, where we are gathered as one community, where our real souls are exposed, where, as I like to say, if we were only a soul, if we were only a soul, and we're given a chance to come back once a year and prance around freely, without limitation, it would be in the Elah of Yom Kippur. And that is such a moment now that we gather here today recognize what is sacred in our lives and to devote ourselves to continued daily commitment to uphold that which is sacred in our lives. I want to begin my comments first by taking a moment to appreciate something that we probably don't take enough time to appreciate. We just completed a Sefer Torah, and then we walked outside, fully exposed, down a street. The DeKalb County Police closed off La Vista Road. We expected them to do that, to protect us from the traffic and from anyone else. We crossed and took our time, marched into a shul, newly renovated because we said we wanted to do that and nobody in the government said we're not sure or we don't like it or we won't let you. We live in a country that is a gift and it is time, it is appropriate for us to take the time to appreciate the fact that a Kaddish Baruch Hu has given a gift the United States of America. Thank God for the USA. Don't get into politics, but we managed to build a wall faster than the President of the United States. In that mode. It's important for us to take time to fully appreciate the people who stood for the show. And my father says we don't mention names because we always get in trouble, and so I won't. But there are people here who went above and beyond any call of duty, who extended themselves for this project when others were hesitant, when others were not sure. And there were people here who gave me and others encouragement and more encouragement and strength and conviction and insight and creativity. And you know that what you contributed to the show will have eternal value. And we appreciate very much what has been done, all of us, including those who don't even know about you, are beneficiaries. And I can't speak for God, but everything that I know says that he appreciates the glory that you enhanced 
by all of your efforts and by the Mesiras Nefesh, the sacrifice that you undertook in order to make this project possible. Yasha Kochachem. I have to tell you something. You know, I did a lot of soliciting for this project, a lot of conversations with many, many people. There's one conversation that haunts me. It wasn't a negative conversation. It didn't go at all the way I expected. First of all, I'll tell you that I got absolutely no money from this couple. I asked them for a significant amount, and they said no. And here's what they told me. They said, we believe in the future of the Jewish people, and therefore we're not going to give you a penny. And I said, come again? And they said, we believe that the future of the Jewish people is in Israel. And we believe there's no future for the Jews in America. And we believe that whatever you build will have very short-term value because this is not our future. And we don't even like the things we're seeing. We don't like the direction things are going. And Rabbi, don't you believe that ultimately we're going to experience the Geula and we're all going to return to Israel? Why are we investing funds in this project? And I was soliciting them, so I didn't want to give them a whole sermon. But I thought about it, and I've been thinking about it for a couple of years. Why have we invested so much effort in this ongoing project to renew and refresh our show? Why would we take this so seriously? Aren't we believing Jews and aren't we davening three times a day? We pray that God's glory will be restored fully to Yerushalayim, to Tzion. What are we doing? Talking about enhancing God's glory here. It's a good question. And if our prayers are answered, this is an awful waste of money. Other than the fact that our Gemara tells us that the Bata Midrashos and Bata Knesios of Chutzla Aretz, the houses of worship and the houses of study of the diaspora, will be brought back to Eretz Yisrael when Mashiach comes. And with that statement, the sages redefined what it is to have a shul. Because the sages understood that exile is not a political issue and it is not a geographic issue. Exile is actually a mission of the Jewish people. Exile is not some interruption of Jewish history in which we really shouldn't be here at all. And we're just waiting for the interruption to be over and then we'll get on with it the way things should be. We have a mission here because we didn't accomplish our mission in the ideal way. And our mission is the same as it was before, but we've got to do it differently. We have got to bring the Word of God to the entire world, not by being that example isolated and focused in Eretz Israel, but by scattering ourselves to the four corners of the world and sharing the reality of the presence of God in daily life to the entire world. And we have to do that by standing for Kedusha, by standing for the notion that human beings can be elevated, by living lives of sanctity, by living lives of honesty, lives of generosity, lives of loving God and loving humans, lives of connection, lives of recognizing that we are all one. And when we finally bring that message to the world, when we live those lives here, when we invest in Kedusha here, when we say that the glory of God can be felt here in Atlanta, Georgia, and we share it with others because we know that if they don't have it, we don't have it. That's when salvation comes. That's when this show will be an embassy for Eretz Yisrael. And what we've done here today is we are dedicating an embassy for the Kedusha, for the sanctity of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's presence in this world and in the entire globe. 
not only now, but la'asid lava for eternity. And every drop of investment we make in this shul is an investment in our destiny. And people will come here, it could be for one day, it could be for 10 minutes, it could be for years and decades, but what they touch in this space will transform the entire world. What we celebrate today is literally the, the future salvation of the world because we Jews are committed to sharing the presence of HaKadosh Baruch Hu Almighty with the entire world. That's what we're here for. Which brings me to an important comment. Something that I want to remind you all of that you already know. It's something that we need to be present to. This is a beautiful space. Sandy Cooper took our vision, our dream, the comments of many, many dozens of you, in meetings and meetings and more meetings, revisions and revisions, and created a physically beautiful space. It's intimate, it's grand, it's fresh, it's clean, it's modern, and it's ancient. Beautiful job. And none of this is worth anything if it isn't a perfect match to the spiritual quality of life that we undertake, both in this space and outside. None of this has any value because of what went on here for 50 or 60 years, unless we so treasure what went on here in the past that we bring it into the future, unless we understand that the courage that it took to create that past is the courage that it will take to create this afternoon, to create tomorrow, and create the next day. What's beautiful about this show is that we don't have to say that we come together as a community to dedicate a space and then leave it because it will be abandoned, it will be empty, it will not be used, it will not be worn down, it will not be visited, it will not inspire, it will not create connection one to the other or one to God. Thank God we gather together in a beautiful space that is honored by the devotion and the passion and the commitment that we all have to the notion of tefillah, of davening, of talking to our Creator, and of bringing Him into our lives moment by moment everywhere in our relationships with the rest of the world. That's what makes this beautiful, because this is a perfect match for the spiritual energy and grace of this community. It's a privilege to stand at this pulpit and welcome you into your shul, the shul that you built with your kavana, with your devotion to tefillah, with your zeal for absorbing more of what God wants. There are very few rabbis who are as energized as I am by a community such as you. And that is what gives me a sense of hodah. That's why what we just sang, Ma'ashiv Lashem, how can we thank God for all of his goodness? What's so beautiful is that he's given us a path that we can follow, and he's given us a space that we can invade and spend time with him. Thank God. I want to close by sharing with you a very painful moment that I had this morning. A member of our community called me. She knows that we're dedicating the show today. She called to share with me the terribly sad news that she lost a great grandchild this morning in Yerushalayim. And she's not here today. She wished she could be. And I said whatever I could to help share her pain, to let her know that we understood what she was going through. 
that we would have her in mind in our tefillos. And that helped me realize, my father said it before, what will happen in this room is amazing. Spiritual intensity can be cut with a knife. The dreams of each person, the worries of every individual, the concerns, the joy, the celebrations, the begging, all of it is what fills this room. When we dedicate this space, we dedicate this space so that this will be the source from which God will hear all kinds of tefillos. And that's why we must honor in every possible way the divine presence that we brought in here. That's only here because we said that we're going to bring it in. If we honor it by the way we walk into the show, by the declaration, Matovu or Halacha Yaakov, how goodly are your tents, O Yaakov. If we honor it by concern for every little scratch that might come to some of the new woodwork. If we honor it by making sure that we follow the halacha about when we talk in shul and when we don't, and what we say in shul and what we don't. If we honor it by truly treating this as sacred space, then we will truly have dedicated this space. Every single day, we will be dedicating this space. And that's what I ask and what I encourage and what I insist we do. We must treasure this space so that the Shekhinah, which is so delicate a presence, it's so delicate a lover, the Shekhinah does not take well to insults. God's divine presence runs when it's not welcome. So that Shekhinah, let's welcome it in. Let's devote ourselves to continued embrace of his presence and of each other. Mazel tov to every single one of you. Just being here enhances the simcha. Rabbi Lau, it's an honor to us that a man of your stature comes here and shares his thoughts, as we will hear in a few moments. And I give a yashakar to every single member of this community for rising to an occasion which is larger in any one of us. Mazel tov.
Usher Yaakov Kabobro, and I am nine years old. I am thankful to Hashem for many things. I live at home with my parents and my brothers and sisters. I go to a school that I love where I learn both Torah and regular subjects. I love my soul and I love our community. Everyone in here feels like family to me. I am very thankful that my parents are always here for me. They teach me Torah values, they make sure I do my homework, and they took me in every night. When Rabbi Ella was my age, he had none of these. He lost his beloved parents. He lived through years of war. He survived the concentration camp. And his life was pretty much shattered. But Rabbi Ella's spirit remained strong. And with great courage, he rebuilt a life. A life that gave spiritual leadership to Jewish people everywhere, including me including all of us. So it is my great honor to introduce Chief Rabbi Israel Mayor Lau. the rabbi of the Jacob congregation in Atlanta, Georgia, God Arav, Ilan Daniel Feldman Schlita. Emeritus rabbi, the founder of the community, the founder of the shul, God Arav Emmanuel Meni Feldman Schlita. Brokens, I must to add something. I have a very special, intimate, emotional solidarity with Rabbi Emanuel Feldman. I will tell you why. That's right that we are both Rabbonim. That's right that we both made Aliyah. I made Aliyah in 1945. He made Aliyah a little bit later. <laughs> but I wasn't forced to come. No one asked me. My brother brought me as a child. I didn't know where I'm going. He made it from free will, good will. He made the choice to go on Aliyah to live in Yerushalayim. I'm not as privileged as him to live in Yerushalayim. I live only in Tel Aviv. But one thing we have in common, and not very many have it, maybe in the Hasidic movement, it's regular. In the yeshiva world, it's also regular, but in the rabbinate, it's very rare. His son, Rav Ilan Feldman, is replacing the seat of his father, and with such a success, he is leading the community that his father founded. To be on the place of the father, this is a great accomplishment and the greatest nachas of a father to see his son sitting with such a love and admiration of the community to his son. I have almost the same destiny. My son is today the chief rabbi of Israel. So I was 10 years, you cannot be more than 10 years cadence as chief rabbi. And for the first time in the history of the rabbinate, since Rav Kook, Zechel Tzadik Yivracha, we were privileged that Rav Ovadia Yosef, his son, and the Badel Chaim Arukim, me, to see my son elected. I didn't nominate him. Elected and beloved to sit on my seat and to be the chief rabbi of the state of Israel. So I understand Rav Emanuel very well. We are very close and emotionally very, very close each to the other. President of the community, the board of directors, Council General of Israel, Kodar Rabbanim, 
donors of this magnificent shoe. The innovation of such a sanctuary, very rare in the world to see a building like this, very rare. I was amazed when we entered to say Matovu Alecha Yaakov, I knew where I'm going to, but I didn't expect to see such a beautiful building, and I can only quote my father-in-law. Rabbi Yitzchak Yadidia Frankel, who was the chief rabbi of Tel Aviv, he came once to a dedication of a new shul in Tel Aviv. It was a large synagogue, maybe not like this, large enough. And he said, I say a blessing just the contrary to a blessing we say in a Brit Mila, in circumcision. Brit Mila? It's a dedication of a new shoe. In Brit Mila we say, Zehakatan, this little one, the child, Gadol Yidye. I say about the synagogue just the contrary. Zehagadol, this huge building, Kataniye, will be too narrow, too small, because many people will join the shul, and many others will want to be members in Bay Jacob of Atlanta. All the other Jews who are not members yet, and they will come and say, we want to be a part of it. So Dehagadol, this huge building, Kataniye, will be too small, too narrow, and you will have to increase it to ask a permission to increase the shoe. This is a great blessing for a shoe. What is a shoe? A shoe has in Hebrew three titles. We call it Beit Tfilah, a house of prayer. Isaiah the prophet thinks about Beiti, my house says the Lord Almighty, so the first thing is a place of prayer. Shaharit, Mincha Mahari, who speaks the holidays, Rashi Chodeshi Musaf, Neila of Yom Kippur, Kol Nidre. First of all, the function of this building is to be a Beit Fila. Number two, there is another expression in Hebrew, Beit Midrash. A place where we learn Torah, we study, we have lessons, shiurim, speeches of the rabbi, the assistant rabbi. All together, it's not only a place to pray and go home. Today is Dafayomi Bava Batra Kufamachet. You know that there is a shiur, daily shiurim. Because after 120 years, when we come to heaven, the Lord Almighty asks each of us the first question, Kavata itim la Torah? Have you spent permanent times to learn Torah? To make from the shul not only Beit Fila, but also Beit Hamidrash? And the third title of this building is the most popular one, Beit Knesset, a place of a gathering. These are the three fundamentals I saw written on the cover of the Torah, which was brought in by Mr. Schloss today to Beijing. A place of Masechet Avot. Shimon HaTzadik said, Al shlosha dvarim ma'olam omed. Al ha-Torah, this is Beit HaMidrash. Al ha-Avodah le'ovdo b'chol levavchem. To serve the Lord Almighty in all your hearts means to daven, to pray. This is Al ha-Torah, Beit Midrash. Al ha-Avodah is Beit Fila.
speak together. Today, when the Torah scroll was entered, to dance together, to be happy together, Beit Knesset is the third fundament of the world. Torah, Beit Midrash, Avodah, Beit Tfilah, Gemilut Chasadim, all together, Beit Knesset. The way you opened the dedication of the renovations synagogue was a beautiful way. And you, Sefer Torah, the donation of Mr. Schloss and his family, look, this parade from his home to the shul was a demonstration of Kedush Hashem. The chupa, and under the chupa, walking with the Torah school and Yusef Torah, singing all the way. People all around could see the Jews are happy. Why? A new Torah scroll is given word to, to the shul, to the center. And I want to say one word about the center. King David says in the Psalms, chapter Kufiutet 119, If I want to understand the importance, the holiness of your commandments, I can learn it from my enemies. You make me more understanding, more understood by my enemies. What means? If you want to understand the importance of this shul, of this day of the dedication of the beautiful shul here, learn it from our enemies. What do I mean? The Nazis, Yemach Shemon, brutal as they were, evil as they were, they were the devil itself, but they were smart. They learned very well what makes the Jews a nation, what gives them the power, what is the uniqueness of the Jewish people. Why are they still in existence after all the nations from the old time when they came up on the stage disappeared? They learned the story of the Jewish people. How come? They are in exile. Hundreds above hundreds of years in exile. Destroyed their homeland. Destroyed the first and the second temple. They have no army. No government, no parliament, nothing. They have no nation, and still they exist. All the others, empires, Amon, Moab, Balak ben Sipo, king of Moab, Midian, Aram, Plishtim, Tzor Sidon, Ashur, Babel, Paras Umadai, Yavan, the old Greeks, Roma, Cartago, where are they? Where is one of them? There was no genocide and pogroms and holocaust. So the Germans, smart. They knew that the heart of the Jewish people is the shul. So the first affair, Nazis affair organized was 10 months before World War II broke out, I mentioned it. Kristallnacht. November the 9th, 1938. Ten months before the war broke out. They didn't attack Rothschild banks in Germany. They didn't attack the bureaus, the offices of the Jewish doctors and the Jewish Lawyers and the Jewish accountants, they were men. No. They attacked the synagogues, the shoes. In one night, they have destroyed thousands, 
46 synagogues throughout Germany. Over a thousand in one night. This was a pogrom. Why against the shul? They called it very nicely Kristallnacht. They broke in the chandeliers made of crystal. They burned the Torah scrolls. And some Jews who gave their life to protect the Torah scrolls were killed on the spot. 3,000 years, 3,000 in one night. Why did they do it against the Jews? Because they knew the secret. Jewish existence, Jewish survival, is because of the Shul. Because the Shul is the heart of the Jewish people. If someone suffers of a tooth, a hand or a leg, it's easy to recover, full recovery. But if the heart, God forbid, is not a well, it's a danger for the whole existence of the whole body. They knew that the shoe is the heart, our heart. If it is alive, we are alive. If it is full of vitality, we are vivid forever. This is the secret. So you may understand my feelings. When I was here for the first time, 34 years ago, and I met Rabbi Manuel Feldman Schmitter here in Atlanta. He asked me to come to his shul, Beit Jacob. What was the Beit Jacob? Can you imagine 34 years ago? You don't have to imagine. You know. A shtibu, a room. A small synagogue. And then we could say, like in the police, this little one will be great. I didn't dream about such greatness like this one I see and I face today. For the Rav, Rav Ilan, all your members, your staff, of course, and the donors, that they gave not money, they gave their hearts. Look this beautiful place. I wish you all long life, good health, a lot of lovers, and make the shoe the heart of the whole city. All the Jews who are here in Atlanta, who will join us, knowing that here are the three fundamentals very, very alive. Torah, Avodah, and Milut Chasadim. Beit Midrash, Beit Tfilah, and Beit Knesset. And in this privilege, in this schut, we will resolve to have in the Temple Mount, the Holy Land, in Yerushalayim, the Beit HaMikdash, Amen. Thank you, Rabbi Rao, for your inspiring words and powerful words. And the Torah that was dedicated as was mentioned earlier, stands for Torah Avodah and Gemilas Chasadim, is in memory done by the Shlas and Resnick families. Yitzchak Zvi ben Avraham Aryeh Halevi, he himself was a survivor, a very family oriented man, although not a particularly religious man, made sure to support Torah education in the United States, a big Baal Tzedakah, somebody who shared his wealth that he achieved as he realized the American dream and uh, always believed on the three th about the three things that the world stood and that's why the Torah mantle contains that edict from the May his memory be blessed. 
In closing, I also want to take this uh, opportunity to acknowledge the presence of colleagues, Rabbi Benjamin Friedman of the Congregation Ariel, and Rabbi Adam Starr of the Congregation Young Israel of Toko Hills, and I know there are others who are out of town. We yeah, thank you for sharing with us, and I know that you particularly appreciate the significance of this moment in the life of a Kehila. <clears throat> and finally, uh, as, bef as before we close, for Adon Olam, I want everybody to please have in mind for a tefillah, Yaakov Aharon ben Adina Baluma, who is a young child uh, who has a rare form of cancer, and it is appropriate that we use this gathering in this space for us to have in mind Yaakov Aharon ben Adina Baluma, the Rafua Shlema. We're going to go out with Adon Olam, a song that we sing at the end of tefillah all the time, attributing the greatness to the master of the universe. Yashikach to our Yaakov choir. We are all invited to a reception in the Heritage Hall, sponsored by the Shlas and the Western families in honor of the Siyam HaSefer. Mazel Tov to every single one of you.